God reinforces to me that he's speaking to us. And Miss Hattie today showed me her verse before church, and we're going to be talking about that. And uh, he's really impressed on my heart this week. And by the way, parents, if you need a coloring book or something, raise your hand. And we've got some. I see a hand. Hattie and Addie want a coloring book. Donnie, you want a coloring book? You good? Okay. All right. Oh, well, I can't stay within the lines. That's just... This... God showed me this week, used to, we would... Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but we bought a whole lot of dope in the Walmart parking lot. <laughs> and we would sit there, and I would see people that, I, that we knew walk by the deal. And we'd be in the car a lot, lot, for a lot of time, for a long time, and so we'd begin to make up conversations what these people were saying going into Walmart. And, uh, and I'd entertain the, the car most of the time with that, but you would see people you knew walking by having no idea what was going on around them. They were just in their own little world, and they were going into Walmart having their own conversation, having no idea. They just walked through the middle of a, a, a methamphetamine sale or whatever. And sometimes, if it was more serious, and it was people that we weren't sure about, or, uh, you know, if they were dangerous, you know, we, we didn't get to dictate all the time where it was, so a lot of times they would pick something like Walmart, and I'd think these people walking in have no idea that all these guns are out here around them. A lot of them are the good people, but there's also the bad people, and if it goes wrong, you know, they have no idea what they're walking through. And they just went on in and shopped and come out, and they never knew. And I thought this week God showed me the, the deeper I get into his word and the more I study, that's exactly what's going on today. People are living their lives and they're in their own little world and they have no idea spiritually what's going on and what's about to happen. And I love it when he gives me a physical illustration of what he's trying to say to us. And this week he did just that. And I want to ask you, do you remember a time when people would hold the door open for other people? You still see it some, uh, but a gentleman always opened the door for a lady. Amen? Amen? But I want you to know today, I am giving, you will leave here with a charge from God, with a mission, with a job. And I want you to know what the church is doing today we are holding the door open for Jesus Christ to reach the lost. We're holding the door open for the lost. Let's put it to you this way. I have a gate inside the barn where if I want to open it wide and let many cows through at the same time, I have to put a prop up to that gate to hold that gate open because the gate will not stay open on its own. Folks, the church is that prop. The gate is Jesus Christ. When that gate, when the prop is moved, the door will shut. When the church is raptured, the door will shut. When the church is called home, folks, the door will no longer be held open. Then the people left behind must open the door themselves. Now let me ask you something. If, a, if you live in a world where you not, will not go through a door that's held open for you, what makes you think you'll open the door on your own and walk through? It's going to be harder to come to God than it is now. And I think I live in a world, no, I know I live in a world, where most people need to walk through the door and meet Jesus Christ. But you see... We're the only thing left in this world. This morning, if you're under the sound of my voice and you're a born-again child of God, and I mean a born-again child of God, not somebody playing it, if you are truly born again, you are holding the door open. You're the only thing left in this world. You're the only thing left to show the people about Jesus, to tell the people about Jesus. So if you would this morning, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. When you find that this morning, if you would stand to honor the reading of God's word, I'm just going to read you three verses. But as my young friend Hattie 
and Katrina have both sung about the light this morning and talked about the light. We're going to talk about it because it is you this morning, church. Chapter 5, verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this beautiful day, Lord. We thank you for the Sunday school lesson that you sent us and the messenger you sent it to us through. We thank you for the wonderful songs that were sung. And Lord, we thank you so much for the children standing in your church, Lord, and, and, and worshiping you. Lord, now it comes the preaching of your word. Lord, please forgive me of my sins, Lord. Cleanse this vessel. And Holy Spirit, I pray, God, you rise up in me and speak through me this morning the words that you'd have spoken. And Holy Spirit, I pray you rise up in all of us and open up our ears, Lord, of our heart to help us hear you, Lord, and apply it to our lives and be what you've called us to be. And in Jesus' precious holy name, his church prayed. Amen. So what are we to do? How we are to hold the door open. How do you do that? You let your light shine so others can see the, see the way while the door is still open. I want you to think about when Noah built the ark and all the people that laughed at Noah and you know, and they had never even seen rain. They didn't know what rain was and he was telling them, you know, get, he was warning them. Can you imagine the fear and the trembling in people's lives the day the door shut and the rain began to fall? Then they wanted in, but then what was it? It was too late. Why? Because the door shut. Folks, I want you to understand the, the ark was a symbol of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, arms are open, and today, even if you're under the sound of my voice and you've never given your heart and soul to Jesus Christ, you thank God today because you, you've got another chance. The door is still open. Why are we still here? Why is the church still here? Because God has not told Jesus to go get his church yet. God is still being patient with us. But folks, I'm here to tell you one day that will end. And nobody knows that day. It could be today when he's had enough. And folks, wouldn't you have had enough by now? Y'all better thank God I'm not God because I would have pushed the button on us a long time ago. <laughs> she sounds like she speaks from experience. But we keep mocking God. <laughs> and we keep ignoring the truth. We keep trying to change the truth. We keep trying to just pull further and further away from God. Make him a side note. We don't need God, folks. You realize how arrogant we are. We think in this country, we think we've got everything. We've got it so good because we're so smart and we work so hard. Folks, we got it because our ancestors were blessed because they served Jesus Christ. That's why we're where we're at. Not because of who we are or what we do, but because of who he, was, who he is and what he done. But you see, I just want to ask you this morning, are you holding the door open for God? If you're a child of God this morning, you better be holding the door open. Now, let me ask you something. Those that are around you every day, why would they want to go through the door you're holding open? Do they see something different in you than they do the world? Do they hear something different from you than they do the world? Is there something different about you? Have you ever met somebody that you had never been around before, you just met them, and there was just something different about them. You just felt drawn to them. Well, you know what that is? That's Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes we don't give the devil enough credit. Amen? Did you know the devil can draw you in too? Did you know he's very charismatic? He's very... Uh, Appealing to the eye, very appealing. You know, there's a story a young girl tells. She walked out of school one day, and it was raining, and she said, this very attractive man come up to me and said, you know, would you like me to walk you to your car with your umbrella? She said, he's so charming and nice, and she said, I just felt so warm and fuzzy about him. She said, I just felt really good about him. And then she said, he walked me to my car, 
And she said, only t years later, I saw the man again on the news, and his name was Ted Bundy. You realize how close she was to being another victim. Folks, just because you feel warm and fuzzy, I want to tell you today, that's not, it's not necessarily God. Amen? The devil likes to mimic God. So what do we need to tell the difference? Discernment. That is what is missing in today's world, discernment. I'm not going to get political this morning, but I saw something that enrages me because they want to clump Christians. They want to bring us, they throw us around like a rag doll. May I tell you something? As far as I know, there's nobody in Washington, D.C. that gives a rat about us. Amen? They do not care about Christians or you or me or, and uh I just wish they would let me on national TV for 30 seconds. I'd be banned for the rest of my life, but I, I'd like 30 seconds. It come across my phone this morning asking why 65% of evangelical Christians in the United States of America stick with Donald Trump. I was like, okay, who are you asking? What are you sticking with? I said, I said, why don't we just, they said, why is that so? Because he's such an immoral man. It, it, they list all the things. And I said, why don't you ask a true Christian? And I'll tell you. Because there's no other choice. You cannot, when you have half of America that will stand for the killing of babies and the same-sex marriage, you back us into a corner. You give us no Folks, we don't have, if it is Trump and Biden again, may I tell you, there is no good solution. We need Jesus Christ, amen? And wouldn't it be nice if we had a wonderful Christian man to run this country? It would be awesome. But let me be the first to tell you, you know who don't have a chance in this country? A wonderful Christian man. You know why? Because he won't sell out for the money that it takes to back him. But I'm like, quit throwing us around. Why don't you come? Number one, I don't, know, I don't know who you're asking all these questions. But why don't you talk to the true Christian church about what we want? We want a man in there that will pray. We want a man in there that will open his Bible. And folks, how long has it been since we've had that? I don't remember it in my time. But quit slinging us around. And folks, that door... They talk about us like we're a, 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 a number that needs to be swung to the right or left. No, we're a, we're a number that has the door open, and the rest of them need to come through the door that we've already walked through. But you see, I want to read you some scripture this morning to something that a lot of people don't believe is going to happen, but it's going to happen. Do you believe in the Bible this morning? Do you believe it is an inspired word of God? Do you believe if it says it, it's going to happen? Well, then listen to what it tells us in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Just listen to what Paul tells us. But I would, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, or as we would say in their time, that are dead, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, wait a minute. If they're dead and in their grave, how's God bringing them with them? Their souls, okay? Their bodies are in the grave. Their souls are with Jesus. So if your loved one was saved and they're dead right now, I want you to know their soul is in heaven. Their physical body is in a grave. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The bodies will come out of the graves first. Then we which are alive and remain, that's if we're alive when the rapture happens, that's us, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord." Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What I just read to you is what we commonly call the rapture. 
of the church. Okay, rapture is not in the Bible. The word rapture is not used. That is just a term that we use, but here's what it means. Jesus is coming after his church, okay? And if we happen to be alive during that time, you, you, here's one of two ways. If you're a Christian, here's one of two ways you're going to go. If you've already died, your soul is going to come meet your body in the air, your new body. And then you're going to be there, and you're going to wait on those who are alive and remain. And then if you're alive and you haven't died, when you hear the trumpet, you're going to go up into the clouds and meet Jesus in the air. Jesus is not coming to the earth that time. That's why it says we will meet him in the air. When Jesus plants his feet on the earth, that is the second coming of Jesus Christ, and he is here to judge the world. Amen? And we get to come with him to that too. Amen? Now, here's me and my wife was talking about this this morning, and the more I get into this, the more I realize, you know what? I, I'm not sure how many people are going to go in the rapture. There, I, I promise you there will be preachers still preaching. And that's sad. You know, we heard something this week. It just, it ought to, it just fired me up. But what is the greatest commandment God ever gave us? And folks, we pass over this. We gloss over this. We say it. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen? We all know that next one, though. That next one's one we jump on with both feet. Love your neighbor as yourself. Back up. What does it mean to love God? Oh, we all say it. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. If the rapture happened today, there'd be a whole lot of people left sitting in church saying, but wait a minute, I love God. Did you really? Did you know if you love God, your actions will show it? Just like this guy said on TV, you know, when, when, we, when we preach this, what do people yell at us? Oh, you're a works preacher. <laughs> no, folks, you can't work your way to heaven. Only by God's grace can you get to heaven. But when you accept that grace, when you accept that forgiveness, your life changes. And if you love God, what does he tell us in John? In Revel what, what does he tell us? If you love me... Keep my commandments. If you love me, obey me. Do you want your kids to obey you? Let's just be honest, kids. When we were little, two reasons we obeyed. Number one was fear. Number two was love, right? But the main one's love. I'm your pastor. I am required to tell you the truth. If you love God, does your life reveal that? Or are you like most people? Most people go to church, give God just a little bit because they want just to do just enough to get by so they can get to heaven. May I tell you what that's called? Lukewarm. Let me tell you where that leads you to hell. And you may face Jesus and you say, well, Jesus, I went to church and, and, and I, I was baptized. And he may look at you and say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because you didn't love me. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not a works preacher. I do not believe that there's things you have to do to get to heaven but there's things I do believe you have to do once you get saved. And if you can tell me why you don't come to church every time the doors open, I'd love to hear it. Because if you love God, you will. And I'm just being perfectly frank with you this morning. If you love God, there's no reason why you wouldn't beat the door down to get into this house. To hear his word, to sing his praises. There's some of you in here that are a wonderful example to me because I'll put out a text or something, you know, I say, you know, hey, do we need to cancel this or that? Uh, no, no, let's have it if we can. <laughs> you do anything to get to go to church. If you love God, that's your attitude. Hear me this morning. If that's not your attitude, check yourself because I'm here to tell you you're headed in the wrong direction. And, yes, I am telling you you're headed to hell because you don't love God. 
You may have said the words like I did when you were 13 years old. You may have, and you may be playing it right now. But playing it don't work, folks. Half and half don't work. Three quarters and a quarter don't work. You're either 100% in. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you're gonna, not going to stub your toe. And I'm not, go, I'm not saying that we won't that things don't happen. I'm not saying that you have to be in here every Sunday morning. That's not what I'm saying. But here's what I am saying. God knows the intent of your heart. He knows whether you want to be here. Folks, you can be here and be as lost as a goose. I've done it. I have performed it. I have sat in church and been lost as a goose. I don't want anybody to follow that. So, if you don't have a desire to come to church, don't tell me you love God. You may not like the preaching. That's fine. There's a bunch of churches. Find somewhere where you do like the preaching. But might I suggest it line up with the Bible? You may not like the singing. Plug your ears. <laughs> or sing loud enough to drown it out. You may not like the color of the carpet. It's nicer than what's in hell. You may think the pews aren't comfortable. Try hell. You may think the thermostat's either too hot or too cold. Try hell. Folks, at the end of the day, we need to quit trying to fool each other. We need to examine yourselves this morning. If you faced Jesus today, could you tell him honestly you loved him? Would your life show it? Because may I tell you, he knows it. I want to move just for a minute to what happens after we read in Thessalonians. What happens in this world after the church is gone? After that prop is kicked out and that door shut? After the church is no longer standing there holding the door open, showing them the way? What happens then? Well, we got to go back in time to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verses 28 and 29. Listen to what is described. The Lord will smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. And thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness. And thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. And thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore. And no man shall save thee. Who's coming to impersonate Jesus in the end? The Antichrist, right? What is he? He is a man. No man shall save thee. Folks, may I tell you this morning. If you show up here next Sunday and some of us are missing and we didn't call you, <clears throat> we're not on vacation, you missed the rapture. Here's my instructions to you. If you missed the rapture, obviously you were not saved, so you done something wrong. Hit your knees before you leave this building and make things right with God and be ready to be tested like you've never been tested before. Open your Bible and read it while it's still legal to have it because you will not be able to have it long. Soak it up. It's not too late. It's just going to be harder. Much, much harder. So how, while we're still here, how are we to hold the door open while we're here? The answer to that is Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. For, what, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they teach? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands. But when I read that verse, I bet many of you thought that meant pastor, preacher. I'm fixing to flip it right back on you. You're going to have to carry this weight because this is yours. How many of you consider yourselves a preacher? You are. Your life preaches the gospel of God or your life preaches the gospel of Satan. 
either one. What are you preaching? Listen to what it says. How will they believe if they've not heard? How do they hear? Does God come across the intercom in a big booming voice like he did when Moses was, was around? Does he do that anymore? No. Does God talk to us individually uh, like, like I'm talking to you like Jesus did when he walked on the earth? No. How does he talk to us today? Through who? The Holy Spirit. Where is the Holy Spirit? Inside of who? Everybody? No. The believers. The true children of God. So if you're under the sound of my voice this morning and you are born again and the Holy Spirit is indwelt in you, you are called to preach the word of God through your life. You're not called to stand up in front of the church. Some of you may be. Some of you men may be called to do that another time. But what I'm telling you is you are called to preach the word of God through your life. When people see, you do realize some of you are the only Bible that some of these people in this world will ever see or hear. You're called to preach the word of God through your life. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel. Now, listen to this. How shall they preach? How shall you preach unless you be sent? And you say, oh, that's a big load off me because I hadn't been sent. Is that really what you want to stick with this morning? How many of you with an amen know that you've been sent to preach the word of God? Mm, that's a little weak. I'm going to share a very familiar scripture with you. Because it's Jesus speaking to us, speaking to you. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. You may not have known till today, but today you know. Today, it is laid on your heart. If you're under the sound of my voice and you are truly a child of God, he has called you, he has sent you to share his word with this lost and dying world. He has sent you to hold the door open for the lost. Now, before I close, if you're here this morning, and you don't love God. I don't care what you say. I don't care how many times you say it. If in your life, in your heart, what you, how you live and what you do does not reflect, reflect that you love God, I want you to know this morning, you're not holding the door. You're in need of going through the door. Do not lie to yourself. What good does it do other than it sends you to hell? So this morning... I want to charge you with one of two things. You either, if you're here this morning and you're truly saved, don't lie to yourself. If you're truly saved, you hold that door open and you, you proclaim the true gospel. The true gospel. And the true gospel is don't be misled by this world. We're not called to fit in with this world. We're called to share the gospel. And the gospel is we are not good people. We are sinners. And we need a Savior. Amen? We are all sin and come short of the glory of God. And the only way to heaven is through the blood of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that is the only way to heaven. Share that with the world. Now, if you're not a child of God this morning, then what I just said, you need to walk through that door, make that acceptance, get that forgiveness, and repent from your sins and seek him. So this morning, either hold the door and proclaim the gospel, or I beg you, to go through the door and meet the gospel. If you would, stand with me all over this building. I'd ask you to bow your heads this morning. And friend, you're not here by accident. You may have been here hundreds of times, or this may be one of the first times, but you're not here by accident. You're here by divine appointment. And I ask you a question during the sermon. The greatest commandment God ever gave us was to love him. 
That one will keep you out of heaven if you do not love God. You know you love God by your heart. Does he have your heart? It does no good to lie to each other. It does no good to lie to me. It does no good to lie to your spouse or children, whatever. God knows your heart this morning. If you drew your last breath right now and you faced Jesus Christ, would he know you loved him by the way you lived your life? If not, friend, this altar is open. You, you have an uh, eternal date with God. If you need to make it right this morning, I beg you to make it right. I can't do it for you. No one can do it for you. It's a decision. It's up to you. I'm not going to hold you long. But that's the most important decision you could ever make. Don't leave this house unsure. If you're here this morning and you're already a child of God and there's something on your heart or something bothering you, if you need to pray this morning, we'll pray. We'll gather and pray with you. There's power in prayer. If there's anything you need this morning, we'll pray.